Welcome to Discovering. It's a beautiful summer day and we're smallmouth fishing on the Menominee River with my good friend and fishing guide, Mike Mladenek. It's the thing in the summer, you gotta be prepared because you never know what you're gonna catch them on. First, Kristen takes a look at some of the delectables that nature provides. Thanks, Brian. Tonight on Discovering, we're at White Sky Woods Homestead in Jacobsville foraging for wild edibles. Stick around, that's all tonight, right here on Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields Call of the timber wolf the loon's lonesome trill Eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure. Feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. If you find yourself with a little extra time on your hands these days, what better way to spend it than learning about the various plants and berries in your own backyard? I took a ride up to Jacobsville to visit White Sky Woods Homestead to learn about some wild edibles. So one of the first things you want to for sure do when you're going out for wild edibles is to make sure you know what you're picking. <laughs> Um, because you want to make sure that you're obviously getting something that is healthy for you and that isn't poisonous or could be damaging to your health. So here's another wild edible, which is growing in many people's gardens most likely. And it's an amaranth. And it has different common names, but it's a type of amaranth. And um, if you see it kind of flowering at the top here, that's a good indicator. But it has these really strong leafy greens. This is one that we just use in place of spinach. So we harvest very little spinach and we use a lot more of this stuff. And you often find it growing right next to our friend the lamb's quarters. So you can see the lamb's quarters typically is a little bit smaller leaf and the amaranth can get really big. And I do like to pick these when they're younger because um, then they're not so stemmy. Um, but once again, I just chop them all up and I'll saute them or I'll freeze them in a freezer seal bag and use them throughout the winter. And so this one is an amaranth and this other one is the lamb's quarters. So this is a weed that many people are familiar with, except for it's not just a weed. It's called purslane and I pull a lot of it from the garden because it is one of those things again that if you let too much of it grow, it will just seed and then start taking over. This one isn't, I wouldn't eat this one because it's a little sun scalded, it looks like. But this purslane is a delicious succulent that's loaded with vitamins and you can eat it fresh. Or a thing that we like to do is I'll chop it up and add it to this greens mix. We always wash also, by the way, and we only collect the greens from the area that we no, has not been sprayed or anything like that. So if I found a bunch of this growing on the roadside, I probably wouldn't pick it because I don't know what it's potentially come in contact with chemically. But if it's in my own garden, I know that we're not spraying it. So it is safe to eat. I find myself kind of always looking towards the ground when I'm in nature, which <laughs> is um, good because I'm finding lots of really cool things down here. But I have to always notice uh, that I'm looking down and then try to make a point to look around as well. So when I'm looking down, I'm always finding types of plants that I'm either curious about or potentially eating from. This here would be a wild strawberry leaf. And that is not something I would eat just by itself, but it is excellent to be dehydrated or just brewed fresh in hot water and made into a tea. And we actually are in full harvesting right now. We have a lot of it, so we try still, even though there's a lot, to be cautious about what we're collecting because we want to make sure that we're leaving enough for that plant to carry on and enough to share it back to nature. Also, just to think about some of the other critters in nature besides us humans really liked 
to eat these kinds of things. So we think about those critters as well when we're harvesting. We never take more than we need and we always leave more than we take behind for others. So we're just gonna go off trail here for a moment and stop by these beautiful yellow flowers. And this is a flower called St. John's wort or a plant called St. John's wort. And this is, grows everywhere. I see this everywhere on the Keweenaw. And it has a beautiful flower that's yellow. But when this plant is soaked in water, it's in, or if you pick a lot of the blossoms, you'll actually start to turn your fingers red. So it has the type of dye in it that um, leaves kind of a red color behind or like a deep red. But a lot of people know St. John's wort as a healing medicine um, that usually is associated with like the seasonal affective disorder that people up here often feel because it's so dark all winter long. To me, when I see the flowers, it represents the sun, and I know some of the medicinal properties that it has, but this is a wild flower and leaves that you can pick and also add to your herbal tea blend in winter just to kind of bring your spirit up. One of our favorite berries um, is the June berry. Let me see if I can reach this, here we go. This is the first, almost, yeah, I would say these are ripe right here, yes the first ripe ones I've seen this season. So this is one of the first trees you'll see blossoming in spring in the Keweenaw or around the UP. Um, oftentimes it's called a service berry or a June berry. And it has these beautiful purple berries that a lot of people compare sort of to the taste of a blueberry, but they are not a blueberry because they, they're growing on a tree and they're a different variety. So um, we do jams, jellies, and we found a really delicious uh, syrup made out of June berries. So that is definitely on the list for this year for our foraging coming up here. Um, the trick with foraging the June berries is they're usually a tall, skinny, tall tree. And um, that makes it a little bit harder. So this is one of those things that instead of bending down, you have to go up for. So we usually get the ladder out and spend a week or two picking as they come into ripeness. It has a couple little seeds in it, but they're not pit-like or anything. Mm. Oh, wow. Isn't that amazing? That is. And they are that one of those first blossoming trees. They typically blossom right before the apples. At least here they do. So if you just see like bursts of flowers and usually on the edges of the woods, that's the type of area that they like to grow. And that is probably a June berry or service berry tree. And one thing that helps you know your plants is like when you know the plant, you usually know where it grows. So like a June berry or service berry tree often are growing right on the edge of the forest. Um, and the same goes for blueberries. So these here are wild blueberries. We can see here, this, this uh, must be kind of some new growth because it doesn't look like there's a lot of blueberries on it. But... Um, I'm not here for the blueberries right now because it might be a couple more weeks till those are ripe. So what I'm gonna do is actually harvest the leaf. The leaf been studied to have uh, even more antioxidants than the fruit itself. But again, this is one of those things where you're probably not gonna wanna eat the leaf because it doesn't taste good, but um, you can either pour boiling water over it fresh or you can dehydrate it and enjoy it in a herbal blend tea in winter. And that leaf is gonna give you all the goodies that you would get, and in this case, a little bit more from the studies that they show of those really beneficial vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants that you would get from blueberries. So a thing to keep in mind when you're foraging is foraging from your own property is great. If you're gonna forage from other places, you should definitely have the permission of the landowner to do so, or a private land, such as a conservancy or something, you may wanna ask if it's okay to forage on their property as well. So here we have wild raspberries. These are plants that just grow everywhere. So I like to pick the young leaves. So again, I think that they have potentially better flavor and they're a little less fibrous, but these are um, just something that we would dehydrate 
and we would put them in some herbal tea in winter. Another way you could brew it is just to pour boiling hot water over these fresh leaves. And it's a very mild, um, fruity flavor that the red raspberry leaf gives. The other thing that I always try to pay attention to is I don't want to go and strip a whole plant of its leaves. It needs, the leaves provide food for the plant. Um, so I'll take maybe a couple leaves from this plant and then I'll move along to another one. And then that way I'm being respectful to the plant's needs as well as my own. We don't own the land, the land provides for us. So whatever we can do to um, be thankful and kind back to the plants that are providing for us. Red clover is a easy one to find. Again, kind of all over the place. This is another one that can be used medicinally, but I'm really just using it to get some good nutrients. And I like to just pop off the top of the clover and that ends up in my tea. We dehydrate them often and we'll keep all the petals and do that. Or we can just dry the whole head and put that right in our tea. So what we have here is pineapple weed. This is a plant that typically pops up in kind of like a disturbed sites. So this is right next to the driveway. And this is another one of these things, like once you know what it is, you're gonna see it everywhere. So yeah, a way to tell is just to rub this. If it smells just like pineapple, you've found pineapple weed. Mm. So pineapple weed is actually a relative of chamomile. So when you harvest this and dry it and you put it in your herbal blend, you kind of want to think about how chamomile would relax you. Pineapple weed is going to relax as well. And this is one where we'll harvest the whole plant and we will dehydrate it or pour hot boiling water right over it fresh. So I like to blend it with like the berry leaves, like the raspberry and strawberry and blueberry. This morning I went out and I picked red clover raspberry leaf, blueberry leaf, strawberry leaf, rose petals, St. John's warts. I think that does. Pineapple. Oh, and pineapple weed because all herbal tea is better with pineapple weed in my opinion. And then I washed it all. I always make sure that I rinse it really, really good in the sink. And then um, I boiled some water and I put the boiling water over this. And I just use this as like an old French press. And then I like it because it kind of strains all the stuff out. And then this here is a elderberry syrup that I made with elderflower. So I'm gonna just do a slight sweetening in each of the cups with that. I also think it's pretty good without being sweetened. There is a tinge of pink in this. The St. John's wort is what makes it that tone. You can taste the pineapple weed, right? It's pretty good. After a hot day of foraging, this definitely hits the spot. Menominee River is one of my favorite places in the UP, and over the years, I've spent a lot of time filming there with my friend, fishing guide, Mike Mladnik. I had the chance to get back on the water with Mike for a warm summertime morning of smallmouth fishing. Today we're on the Menominee River, of course, my favorite place to fish. We're going to look for some summertime smallmouth. We might be fishing with soft plastics, we might be fishing with topwater baits, maybe some spinner baits. That's the thing in the summer, you got to be prepared because you never know what you're going to catch them on. The hardest part is making a decision on what to use. One deadly tactic on the Menominee River here in the summertime is fishing a stick bait. This is a four and a half inch bait. I'm going to work it wacky style. I got an O-ring, but here's the trick. Before I actually hook it up, I want a little more weight. This isn't heavy enough because it's kind of moving in the current. What I'm going to do is I'm taking a tungsten nail weight and placing it just 
in the center and now I have more weight to my wacky worm and it's going to allow me to get deeper into the water column. Because one thing to remember when you're using a wacky worm what you're trying to do is imitate the crawfish that the smallmouth are feeding on and crawfish you don't find them halfway up around the surface you find them on the bottom so you got to get your bait down to the bottom. hooked it through the, uh, under the o-ring, I don't go through the worm, and why it's called wacky is you could see how it kind of just flutters a little bit. What I'm doing is I'm lifting it and dropping it so I'm getting a, a little movement, and believe it or not, it gets the smallmouth attention, and especially a bait like this, it's kind of green pumpkin, I got some gold flakes on it, and it does resemble a crawfish moving in the water. Right in the shade where he's supposed to be. There we go. Soft plastic jerk bait. Go get your mama. Fishing into some slop, a little heavy weed cover. So I'm gonna just put a, just a basic weedless frog. Nothing fancy. But the important thing on the Menominee River, use these frogs. I like them with the paddle tail. These got pop, 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 pop action. That drives these uh, small mouth and large mouth for that matter too, crazy. What I'm doing is I'm um, throwing this jerk bait just on the edge of the grass and I'm letting it drop a little bit. Smallmouth don't like to go real heavy in that real heavy grass like the largemouth do. They hang on that edge. So I twitch it across, twitch, twitch, and when I get to that end, I just let it drop and pow, that's when this thing hammered it right there.
as many of you I'm sure have heard by now, our good friend and creator of Discovering has passed away. It's a sad time for so many of us who grew up listening to Buck's voice every Monday night for over 30 years. Please watch for a special tribute to Buck episode of Discovering in the near future.